Hello, my name is Dana Leifers and I'm currently a PGY2 Ambulatory Care Pharmacy resident and today I'm going to be talking to you about treatment strategies for diabetes. The mainstay for diabetes treatment is through lifestyle management and should be incorporated into all treatment plans for patients with diabetes. Specifically, all individuals with diabetes should receive individualized medical nutrition therapy as it has been associated with A1C decreases of 0.3 to 1% for people with type 1 diabetes and 0.5 to 2% for people with type 2 diabetes. In overweight and obese patients with type 2 diabetes, modest weight loss, defined as sustained reduction of 5% of initial body weight, has been shown to improve glycemic control and to reduce the need for glucose lowering medications. Sustaining weight loss can be challenging. Weight loss can be attained with a 500 to 750 kilocalories per day energy deficit or in general a 1200 to 1500 calorie per day for women and 1500 to 1800 calories per day for men, which those can be adjusted for the individual patient. The diets used in intensive lifestyle management for weight loss may differ, example high fat versus high carb foods, but their emphasis should be on nutrient dense foods such as whole grains, vegetables, fruits, low fat dairy, lean meats, nuts, and seeds, as well as achieving the desired energy deficit. The diet choice should be based on the patient's health status and dietary preferences. The three main macronutrients of food include protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Specifically for diabetes, there is no evidence that adjusting the daily level of protein ingestion will improve health in individuals without diabetic kidney disease, and research is inconclusive regarding the ideal amount of dietary protein to optimize either glycemic control or a CBD risk. Protein intake goals should be individualized based on current eating patterns. A general recommendation is typically 1 to 1 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day, or 15 to 20 percent of the total calories. Some research has found successful management of type 2 diabetes with meal plans including slightly higher levels of protein, which is about 20 to 30 percent. Now the ideal amount of dietary fat for individuals with diabetes is also controversial. People with diabetes should follow the guidelines for the general population, which is 20 to 35 percent of the energy with avoiding trans fats. Carbohydrates have the most significant effect on blood sugars. Some patients with type 2 diabetes that have erratic blood sugars, especially after eating, may benefit from carbohydrate counting. It is also a very useful tool in the management of type 1 diabetes. As a general rule of thumb, the goal per meal for women is 45 to 60 grams, and for men is 60 to 75 grams per meal. If a snack is needed throughout the day, the patient should try to limit their total carbohydrate count to 15 to 30 grams. Now remember the goals listed in this slide are just estimates and can be modified based on patient-specific response. The most accurate way to calculate carbohydrates is to examine the food label. The total carbohydrate line will determine the grams of carbohydrate that is in that serving size. Now it's always helpful to remind patients to look at the serving size compared to their portion size. For example, on this slide the serving size is one half cup, but if the patient has a full cup, instead of the total carbohydrates being 17 grams, the total carbohydrate for that meal would be 34 grams. Also, sugar-free does not always mean no sugar. Sugar alcohols do contain carbohydrates and can affect the blood sugar, such as sorbitol, mannitol, and xylitol. Your non cali sweeteners, however, do not contain carbohydrates and do not affect the blood sugar. And then for foods as no sugar added, the patient must be cautious because it just means that no extra sugar is added during the process, but it may contain carbohydrates. So again, the patient must look at the nutrition label for an accurate carbohydrates count. Some foods that contain carbohydrates include your grains like your breads, crackers, rice, hot and cold cereal, and pasta, your starchy vegetables such as potatoes, peas, corn, squash, lentils, and beans, 
your fruits and your fruit juices, and then of course your sweets, such as your honey, your jelly, cookies, cake, pastries, ice cream, and pudding. Some foods that contain no carbohydrates include your vegetables, such as your green beans, your lettuce, or your broccoli. Other foods such as plain coffee, margarine, diet soda, and cheese have no carbohydrates. And then your proteins, such as your fish or your beef, will not have any carbohydrates. People with diabetes should limit their sodium consumption to 2,300 milligrams per day. Lowering sodium intake, such as 1,500 milligrams per day, may benefit blood pressure. Now, routine supplementation with antioxidants, such as vitamins E, vitamin C, and carotene, is not advised because of lack of evidence of efficacy and concern related to long-term safety. In addition, there is insufficient evidence of to support the routine use of herbals and micronutrients, such as cinnamon and vitamin D, to improve glycemic control in people with diabetes. Moderate alcohol consumption does not have major detrimental effects on long-term blood glucose control in people with diabetes. Risk associated with alcohol consumption does include hypoglycemia, particularly for those using insulin or insulin secretagon therapies, weight gain, and hyperglycemia for those consuming excessive amounts of alcohol. An exercise regimen individualized for the patient should be incorporated into every treatment plan. In general, at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic exercise is advised. In addition to aerobic activity, muscle strengthening two days per week with each session consisting of at least one set of five or more different resistant exercises involving the large muscle groups should be added to the treatment plan for optimal efficacy. A new recommendation was just published indicating the importance of prolonged sitting interrupted at least every 30 minutes. Now, when developing an exercise plan, providers should perform a careful history, assess cardiovascular risk factors, and be aware of the atypical presentation of coronary artery disease in patients with diabetes. Certainly, high-risk patients should be encouraged to start with short periods of low-intensity exercise and slowly increase the intensity and duration. In individuals taking insulin and or insulin secretagons, physical activity may cause hypoglycemia if the medication dose or carbohydrate consumption is not altered. Individuals on these therapies may need to ingest some added carbohydrates if pre-exercise glucose levels are less than 100, depending on whether they can lower insulin levels during the workout, such as with an insulin pump, and it is also dependent on the time of day the exercise is done and the intensity and duration of the activity. Now, intense activities may actually raise blood glucose levels instead of lowering them, especially if pre-exercise glucose levels are elevated. Providers should assess patients for conditions that might contraindicate certain types of exercise or predispose to injury. If proliferative diabetic retinopathy or severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is present, then vigorous intensity aerobic or resistant exercise may be contraindicated because of the risk of triggering hemorrhage or retinal detachment. Autonomic neuropathy can increase the risk of exercise-induced injury or adverse effects through decreased cardiac responsiveness to exercise, postural hypotension, and impaired thermal regulation. Cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy is also an independent risk factor for cardiovascular death and silent myocardial ischemia. Therefore, individuals with diabetic autonomic neuropathy should undergo cardiac investigation before beginning physical activity more intense than that to which they are accustomed to. Physical activity can also acutely increase urinary albumin excretion. However, there is no evidence that vigorous intensity exercise increases the rate of progression of diabetic kidney disease, and there appears to be no specific exercise restrictions. All patients should be advised not to use cigarettes or other tobacco products, including smoking cessation counseling should be a routine component of care. Non-smokers should also be advised not to use e-cigarettes. There are no rigorous studies that have demonstrated that e-cigarettes are a healthier alternative to smoking or that e-cigarettes can facilitate smoking cessation.
Before we go into pharmacotherapy for diabetes, I want to just take a minute and talk about prediabetes. Specifically, the mainstay treatment, again, for prediabetes is going to be an intensive lifestyle intervention, as it has been shown to reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 58% over three years. Metformin has the strongest evidence base and has demonstrated long-term safety. Metformin should be recommended as an option for high-risk individuals, including those with a history of gestational diabetes, those who are very obese, those with relatively more hyperglycemia, and those with rising A1C despite lifestyle interventions. Screening for and treatment of modified risk factors for cardiovascular disease is suggested for those with prediabetes. Now we will get into the pharmacotherapy for treatment of type 2 diabetes. The backbone of pharmacotherapy for diabetes is the biguanide class, or metformin. Metformin decreases hepatic glucose output by inhibiting glucogeogenesis and increases insulin-mediated glucose utilization in the peripheral tissues. When dosing, it is imperative for the clinician to start low and go slow to help avoid intolerable GI effects. If started at a higher dose, many patients will discontinue therapy, and then you are eliminating one of your best diabetes agents. So in general, the initial dose is 250 to 500 milligrams once or twice daily with a maximum dose of 2,500 milligrams. You may also use the extended release formulation if patients cannot tolerate immediate release, and you can start at 500 milligrams extended release daily. The main reason to renally dose adjust metformin is to avoid the risk of lactic acidosis. The FDA recently changed the renal dosing recommendations, as before as it is based on serum creatinine. Studies have found, though, that the risk of lactic acidosis is pretty rare, and EGFR is a better indicator. So in general, if the EGFR is above 45, it is okay to start metformin. But if the EGFR falls between 30 and 45, patients can be continued but should not be initially started on metformin. And then if the EGFR falls below 30, then the metformin therapy needs to be discontinued. The main adverse drug reactions of metformin include GI upset, mainly diarrhea, metallic taste, lactic acidosis, and vitamin B deficiency. In up to 16% of users, metformin is responsible for vitamin B12 malabsorption and is a casual factor in the development of anemia and peripheral neuropathy. There is little risk of hypoglycemia with metformin. Contraindications include active liver disease, history of lactic acidosis while on metformin, and if a patient has heavy alcohol use, the risk of lactic acidosis can increase and providers should proceed with caution. In general, metformin should be discontinued or held for at least 48 hours when IV contrast is given, again due to the risk of lactic acidosis. Metformin is weight neutral and does not cause weight gain, and studies have shown robust evidence of decreased CBD events. And another great thing about metformin is it is very inexpensive and affordable for patients. It typically will lead to an A1C reduction of about 1 to 1.5% with a greater effect on the fasting plasma glucose, but it will still affect the postprandial glucose as well. The next class is the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists, or GLP-1s. The mechanism of action of these agents include increasing glucose-dependent insulin secretion, suppressing glucagon secretion in a glucose-dependent manner, and slowing the gastric emptying rate. The GLP-1s are broken up into short-acting and long-acting agents. Your short-acting agents include your exenatide or your lexicinatide. The half-life of the short-acting agents are around 2 to 5 hours and can produce an A1C reduction of 0.8 to 1.5%. The short-acting agents do have a stronger effect on the postprandial glucose reduction. Your long-acting agents are listed on the slide and typically have a half-life of 12 hours to days. These can decrease the A1C a little bit more than your short-acting agents with an A1C reduction of up to 1.8%. And unlike your short-acting agents, they have a stronger effect on your fasting plasma glucose. And, and typically, you get better weight reduction with these agents as well.
The GLP ones can be broken into two different categories, including the mimetics and the analogs. Mimetics are derived from the venom of the Gila monster and shares 50% amino acid sequence of human GLP-1. Your agents include your xenotide and your lexicinotide. Your analogs are human GLP backbone and consist of recombinant GLP-1s. Your agents include your liraglutide, dulaglutide, and albaglutide. The issue between the mimetics and the analogs is the formation of antibodies. So typically the mimetics will have more antibiotic production, which can lead to increased injection site reactions, loss of efficacy, and even anaphylaxis. The rate of antibody production is least for the dulaglutide, which is at 2%, and the lexicinotide, which can be all the way up to 70%. I would like to point out a black box warning of the GLP-1s, which include the thyroid C cell tumors. The tumors were found in rodents and were dose-dependent and treatment duration-dependent. It is unknown if GLP-1s cause thyroid C cell tumors, including MTC in humans, because human relevance could not be ruled out by clinical or non-clinical studies. GLP-1s are contraindicated in patients with a personal or a family history of MTC or in patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2, or MEN2. As you can see from this slide, there are many different dosing and maintenance doses for the individual GLP-1 agents. But note that renal dosing is only for xenotide. The most common adverse drug reaction is the nausea. However, the nausea typically will dissipate or fade away after a couple of weeks of GLP-1 therapy. GLP-1s have low hypoglycemia risk and are becoming the go-to class after metformin. The initial dose is often to control for GI distress, as mentioned in the previous slide. GLP-1s also have the added benefit of weight loss, which is 3 to 5 kilograms. You do want to use cautiously, if at all, if the patient has a history of pancreatitis, and definitely discontinue therapy if acute pancreatitis develops. Due to the mechanism of action of delayed gastric emptying, you want to avoid GLP-1s in patients with gastroparesis or severe GERD. Now remember, every product administration is different and each product will require patient training. The typical A1C reduction will be 0.5 to 1%. I would like to take a minute and discuss the LEADER trial as this can have clinical impact into your decision of treatment therapy. The LEAR glutide effect in action in diabetes evaluation of cardiovascular outcome results, a long-term evaluation or LEADER trial, was a randomized double-blind trial that assessed the effect of LEAR glutide versus placebo and standard care on cardiovascular outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes at high risk for cardiovascular disease or with cardiovascular disease. Study participants had a mean age of 64 years and a mean duration of diabetes of nearly 13 years. Over 80% of the study participants had established cardiovascular disease, which included a prior MI, prior stroke or TIA, prior revascularization procedure, or 50% stenosis of the coronary or lower extremity arteries. The leader showed that the composite primary outcome MI, stroke, or cardiovascular death occurred in fewer patients in the treatment group, 13%, when compared to the placebo group, 14.9%, after a median follow-up of 3.8 years with a hazard ratio of 0.87, with a confidence interval of 0.78 to 0.97. When looking at CV death outcomes alone, it was the primary driver for the MACE outcome, with a hazard ratio of 0.78. Whether other GLP-1 receptor agonists will have the same effect in high-risk patients or if this drug class will have similar effects in lower-risk patients with diabetes remains unknown. The sulfonylureas are one of the older classes, and I want to know that the agents listed on the slide, glyburide, glipizide, and glimipiride, are all second-generation agents. First-generation agents, such as tolbutamide, are not recommended in current guidelines and are rarely used, so I will not be going over those agents. Sulfonylureas so stimulate insulin release from the pancreatic beta cells, reduces glucose output from the liver, and increases insulin sensitivity at the peripheral target sites.
The initial dose for gliburide is 2.5 to 5 mg daily with a max dose of 20 mg. It is not recommended if the creatinine clearance is less than 60. Glibozide is started at an initial dose of again 2.5 to 5 mg once or twice daily with a max dose of 40 mg. However, note that the maximum effective dose is 20 mg and most providers will not go over the 20 mg per day. Glibozide is primarily converted into inactive metabolites and may be less likely to cause hypoglycemia in patients with renal impairment compared to other sulfonylureas. A reduced dose may be necessary and avoidance of the sustained release is suggested, but you can base your renal dose based off if the patient is having hypoglycemic events. Glimepiride initial dose is 1 to 2 mg once daily with a max dose of 8 mg. And then the renal dose is 1 mg daily, titrated based on the fasting blood glucose. Sulfonylurea's adverse side effects include weight gain and GI upset. The hypoglycemia risk is moderate to severe, with the most common hypoglycemia happening with gliburide. Typically, you want to avoid gliburide in elderly patients and want to switch over to a different agent such as glipizide or glimepiride. Sulfonylureas are inexpensive, but they do have the same mechanism of action as maglintides, which we'll go over in the next slide, and so you do not want to use these together. Sulfonylureas also have a reduced efficacy over time. A1C reduction is 1 to 2% with mainly focus on the postprandial blood glucose. The meglintides or prandin or starlix is going to be very similar to the sulfonylureas but will have a more rapid onset with a peak of about one hour and shorter duration of action than the sulfonylureas. But they still are a rapid acting insulin secretagon that causes increased insulin secretion, glucose dependent, and diminishes at low glucose levels. Highly tissue selective with low affinity for heart and skeletal tissues. As you can see from the slide, there are different dosing for the two different agents. Like the sulfonylureas, the meglintides do have a cause of weight gain, but notice that they also can lead to upper respiratory infections. The hypoglycemia risk is mild, and some clinical pearls are that the meglintides are contraindicated with gemfibrozil. You can use the meglintides if a patient has a sulfa allergy, or if a patient is having irregular meal schedules, or if a patient has late postprandial hypoglycemia on sulfonylurea therapy. The typical A1C reduction is 0.5 to 1%. Prandin has been shown to be a little bit more effective than the Starlix. DPP-4 inhibitors include citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, and alogliptin. This class is also referred to as the glyptin class. The glyptins inhibit breakdown of GLP-1 secreted during meals and can prolong the action of the endogenous GLP-1. They also cause increased glucose-dependent pancreatic insulin secretion and decreased glucagon secretion in the hepatic glucose production. Saxagliptin can be started at 2.5 or 5 mg daily with the renal dose listed on the slide. Citagliptin can be started at 100 mg daily with the renal dose listed on the slide. Alagliptin can be started at 25 mg daily with the renal dose listed, and linagliptin can be started at 5 mg daily and is the only DPP-4 that does not need a renal dose adjustment. Similar to the GLP-1s, there is a class risk of pancreatitis. So if a patient has pancreatitis either for themselves or if there's a family history of pancreatic cancer, it'd be best to avoid this class. DPP-4s can cause an increased risk of angioedema with an ACE inhibitor. And likewise, the GLP-1s, DPP-4s can also cause initial GI complaints that will eventually diminish over time. Post-marketing reports have shown that severe joint pain can be associated with the DPP-4s, and specifically for saxagliptin and alagliptin, there is an increased risk for heart failure. The hypoglycemia risk is very low for this class. In general, DPP-4s are going to be very well tolerated and also have the benefit of being weight neutral. It is a friendly reminder though to reduce the dose of your insulin or your sulfonylureas if used together with your DPP-4s. And you do not want to use with the GLP-1 because of the similar mechanism of action.
Your typical A1C reduction is going to be modest with about 0.5 to 0.8%, but DPP4s do target both the fasting and the postprandial glucose. The sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, or SGLT2, include your canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and your empagliflozin. The way these agents work is they each inhibit the SGLT2 in the proximal renal tubules, which reduces the absorption of filtered glucose from tubular lumen, which ultimately increases the urinary glucose excretion. Canagliflozin should be administered before the first meal, at an initial dose of 100 milligrams. It can be increased to 300 milligrams once daily. And note that if the EGFR is less than 45, therapy should not be started and therapy should be discontinued. Depagliflozin can be started at 5 milligrams and can be increased to a max dose of 10 milligrams. If the EGFR falls below 60, it should not be started. Empagliflozin can be started at 10 mg once daily, increased to 25 mg once daily, and similar to canagliflozin should not be started if the EGFR falls below 45. The SGLT2 class does have quite a few of adverse drug reactions, including UTIs, yeast infections, and polyuria. If a patient has frequent UTIs, this would not be a great class to start. They do have an added benefit of about a 2 kilogram weight loss, but at the same time, they have been shown to decrease the bone mineral density and potentially cause the increased risk of bone fractures. Because of the continuous water loss, SGLT2s can cause hypotension and dehydration. A provider wants to be very cautious with adding an SGLT2 if a patient already is on a diuretic. SGLT2s have been shown to also increase the chance of euglycemic ketoacidosis. Now, the hypoglycemia risk is low with the SGLT2 inhibitors, and a typical A1C reduction of 0.5 to 1% can be seen. The impa reg outcome trial was a randomized double-blind trial that assessed the effect of empagliflozin versus placebo in standard care on cardiovascular outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes and existing cardiovascular disease. Study participants had a mean age of 63 years, and 57% had diabetes for more than 10 years, and 99% had established cardiovascular disease. The infrared outcomes show that over a median follow-up of three and a half years, treatment reduced the composite outcome of MI, stroke, and cardiovascular death by 14%, with a hazard ratio of 0.86 with a confidence interval of 0.74 to 0.99. Cardiovascular death showed an absolute rate of 3.7% versus 5.9%, with a hazard ratio of 0.65 with a confidence interval of 0.5 to 0.85. And lastly, empagliflozin was shown to reduce hospitalizations for heart failure with a hazard ratio of 0.65 and a confidence interval of 0.5 to 0.85. Based on the Impareg trial, the FDA recently added a new indication for empagliflozin. It can reduce the risk of cardiovascular death in adults with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the key here is that empagliflozin can be used for secondary prevention rather than primary prevention. And similar to the LEADER trial in the GLP-1s, we still do not know if this is a class effect. Final results from the two clinical trials, the CANVAS and the CANVAS-R trial, were just released and showed that leg and foot amputations occurred about twice as often in patients treated with canagliflozin compared to patients treated with placebo. So specifically in the CANVAS, 5.9 out of every 1,000 patients treated with canagliflozin over one year had an amputation compared to 2.8 out of every 1,000 patients treated with placebo over one year. And for Canvas R trial, 7.5 out of every 1,000 patients, and then 4.2 out of every 1,000 patients treated with placebo. Based on these results, healthcare professionals should, before starting canagliflozin, consider factors that may predispose patients to the need for amputations. These factors include a history of prior amputation, peripheral vascular disease, neuropathy, and diabetic foot ulcers.
Monitor patients receiving canagliflozin for the signs and symptoms described above and discontinue canagliflozin if these complications occur. TZDs include pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. These agents improve target cell response to insulin without increasing pancreatic insulin secretion. They activate the PPAR gamma receptors, which are abundant in the cells within the renal collecting tubules. Fluid retention is a side effect of these medications, and that is due to the increased sodium reabsorption. Pioglitazone can be started at an initial dose of 15 to 30 mg per day with a max dose of 45 mg per day. But note that side effects can be reduced by using a moderate dose of pioglitazone, which is 30 mg or less. No renal dose adjustment is needed for pioglitazone. Pioglitazone has been shown to increase the risk of bladder cancer. And so you want to avoid this agent in patients that have active bladder cancer and consider the risks versus benefits prior to starting in a patient with a history of bladder cancer. Rosy glitazone can be started at an initial dose of 4 mg per day or 2 mg twice daily with a maximum dose of 8 mg per day. Similar to pioglitazone, no renal dose is needed. However, rosiglitazone is no longer frequently used due to the risk of heart attacks and CV death with this agent. Some of the adverse drug reactions that make this class less likely to be used include increased weight, edema, which is worse with insulin use, macular edema, bone fractures, and increased LDL specifically with rosiglitazone. The hypoglycemia risk is low, and the TZDs do contain a black box warning for initiation in patients with NYHA class 3 or class 4 heart failure. Before starting a TZD, liver enzymes should be checked and periodically thereafter. Hepatic failure has been reported with pioglitazone, and so patients should be monitored carefully for signs and symptoms of liver injury. TZDs may also result in a resumption of ovulation, increasing the risk for pregnancy. Typically, it takes about 6 to 12 weeks to see the full effect of TZDs for glycemic control. A typical A1C reduction for TZD therapy is 0.5 to 1.4% with a primary focus on the fasting plasma glucose. Bile acid sequestrants can also be used for glycemic control, but is not very commonly seen in clinical practice due to the other agents that can be utilized. Bile acid sequestrants can typically lower A1C by 0.5 to 1%, but is not often seen in clinical practice due to the utilization of the other agents that we just talked about. ADRs include constipation and can also increase triglycerides. Hypoglycemia risk is low, but note that drug interactions may significantly decrease the absorption of medications. Bile acid sequestrants should be taken with meals and should not be used in patients with GI disease or fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. Dopamine 2 agonists, such as bromocryptine, have also been shown to be useful in the management of diabetes. However, like bile acid sequestrants, they're not often used due to their side effects. It's postulated that bromocryptine, when administered during the morning and released into the systemic circulation in a rapid pulse-like dose, may actually reset the hypothalamic circadian activities, which have been altered by obesity, therefore resulting in the reversal of insulin resistance and can decrease glucose production without increasing serum insulin concentrations. However, this mechanism of action is still unknown and needs further research. The A1C reduction is very minimal with dopamine 2 agonists and is about 0.3%. The dose is 0.8 mg once daily and you can increase at weekly intervals until the usual dose of 1.6 to 4.8 mg once daily is obtained. ADRs include dizziness, syncope, nausea, and fatigue. The hypoglycemia risk is low, but it can also have major drug interactions, similar to the bile acid sequestrants. You do want to administer with food to help lessen these GI adverse drug effects.
Alpha-glucosaside inhibitors include acarbose and meglinitol. These are competitive inhibitors of pancreatic alpha-glucoside, resulting in delayed hydrolysis of ingested complex carbohydrates and disaccharides in absorption of glucose. It can inhibit the metabolism of sucrose to glucose and fructose. As you can see, both agents should be dosed with the first bite of meal and can be given up to three times daily. Both agents do have to be dosed upon renal function. Some of the adverse drug effects include flatulence, bloating, and diarrhea, and these adverse side effects are a limiting factor in prescribing this agent. Acarbos can also cause elevated LFTs. Hypoglycemia risk is neutral for these agents. They are contraindicated in patients with DKA, cirrhosis, irritable bowel disease, and chronic ulceration. But they are great agents for patients with postprandial issues without IBS or other GI issues, and they can be used with sulfonylureas. A1C reduction can be seen of 0.5 to up to 0.8% with a main target on your postprandial glucose. Your amylin mimetics include your pramlatide. The pramlatide prolongs the gastric emptying time, reduces postprandial glucagon secretion, and can reduce caloric intake through centrally mediated appetite suppression. Amylin mimetics are dosed upon if a patient has type 1 or type 2 diabetes. In patients with type 1, 15 micrograms is administered immediately prior to major meals. One must reduce the mealtime insulin dose by 50% to avoid hypoglycemia. Clinicians may increase in 15 microgram increments every three days to a target dose of 30 to 60 micrograms. In patients with type 2, you can start at a higher dose of 60 micrograms immediately prior to major meals with the same warning of reducing the mealtime insulin dose by 50%. You may titrate all the way up to 120 micrograms if there's no nausea after three days, and it does not require renal dose adjustments. Similar to the GLP-1s, amylin mimetics have an adverse drug reaction of nausea and vomiting and can also produce weight loss. The hypoglycemia risk is low, but it is very, very high with insulin use. Again, the amylin mimetics have a black box warning of use with insulin increases the risk of severe hypoglycemia, especially in patients with type 1 diabetes. When severe hypoglycemia occurs, it is seen within three hours following an injection. The A1C reduction with amylin mimetics is typically between 0.5 and 1% and is mainly focused on postprandial glucose. Now that we have gone over the agents for type 2 diabetes other than insulin, it's now time to talk about how to decide which agent to initiate in your patients. And really, there's a lot of patient considerations to consider, such as A1C. What is the patient's current A1C, and what is the A1C lowering effect that we need? What is the cost of the medication? Some of the newer agents, such as the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s, are very expensive whereas your metformin and your sulfonylurea therapies are typically inexpensive. And then think about your side effects. If a patient has frequent UTIs, then an SGLT2 inhibitor may not be the best. Or if a patient has recent heart failure hospital emissions, using a TZD probably is not the best option. If a patient is obese and is wanting weight loss and is still needing A1C lowering effect, then maybe a GLP-1 would be the best option for that patient. You also have to consider the past medical history. Is the patient at risk for a high cardiovascular event? Do they have a prior stroke or heart attack? Then maybe empagliflozin based on the infrared outcomes or liraglutide based on the leader trial would be appropriate. Does the patient have pancreatitis or do they have thyroid cancer? then they would not be an eligible candidate for GLP-1s. Also think about route of administration. If a patient is adamant that they do not want injections, then your amylin agent and your GLP-1s cannot be used. If a patient has high risk for hypoglycemia, such as an 85-year-old, then a sulfonylurea option may not be the best. Typically, you start with monotherapy, 
Unless the A1C is greater than or equal to 9%, then you can consider dual therapy. If the A1C is greater than or equal to 10%, or if the blood glucose is greater than or equal to 300, or if the patient has markedly symptomatic symptoms, then consider combination injectable therapy. For a monotherapy, the backbone is going to be your metformin. It has high efficacy, low hypoglycemic risk, with weight neutral and low side effects. Now, if the A1C target is not achieved after approximately three months of monotherapy, then you would want to proceed to two-drug combination. Now, this is where the choice is given to the clinician because the order is not meant to denote any specific preference. Choice should be dependent on the variety of patient and disease-specific factors that were mentioned on the previous slide. If the A1C is not targeted after approximately three months of dual therapy, then you can proceed to a three-drug combination. And again, it is up to the clinician to decide which three agents that the provider wants to use as long as one of them is metformin. The AACE guideline provides an algorithm that is similar to the ADA guidelines, but is somewhat different. If the entry A1C is less than 7.5, they recommend monotherapy, whereas if the entry A1C is greater than 9% and they have no symptoms, they recommend dual or triple therapy. Now, if the A1C is greater than 9% and they have symptoms, insulin plus or minus other agents can be started. For monotherapy, they do not specify that metformin has to be used. Instead, they say that metformin, GLP-1s, SGLT-2s, DPP-4s, even your AGIs can be used, with an emphasis that TZDs and sulfonylureas should be more towards the last line option. Now, if someone has to move to dual therapy, which is if a patient is not at goal at three months, similar to the ADA guidelines, then that is whenever metformin should be added on with another agent. And again, notice that the TZDs and the sulfonylureas, along with basal insulin, should be more of your last line therapy. And then again, if you're not at goal in three months, then you can move on to triple therapy um, and again, the choice is up to the clinician. After triple therapy, if the patient is still not on goal, then you want to add or intensify insulin, and that will be our next subject that we talk about.